laid out even in the Scientific American article, which appeared in, in like in 92, solution to personal privacy in the information age for consumers. But the thing that I believe has impeded its widespread adoption, it's hard to use it. That's where AI could help. Welcome to EFDEM. Meet David Chong, the creator of Digital Cash. What does he see for the future of privacy? Let's find out. My name is Dave Chom, and I am an inventor of uh, principally uh, privacy technologies. Well, I wanted people that are sort of early stage in their career, I think which, you know, the vast majority of those in the audience, uh, to understand that instead of privacy being something that's really, you know, an aspirational battle that's going to be ongoing and we may not uh, win. Uh, in fact, now it's, it's transitioned because of artificial intelligence and some new breakthroughs into a, an opportunity to prevail in a competitive business environment with systems which are, have tremendous uh, disruptive capability. I'm not exactly sure how to define it, but you know, like this, like the Supreme Court says, I know it when I see it. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's. I mean, to me, the the, the essential, uh, important aspect of whatever, you know, fits the this name, is that it empowers individuals to. Uh, operate with uh, enhanced autonomy and yet to be able to influence the direction of society. Well, eCash is quite a good system, but it did not lend itself to running autonomously in a decentralized manner. And even though I'm credited with inventing the blockchain in the first place, eCash was not something that could, could operate there because it requires the issuance of signatures and in a blockchain environment, um, there's not really a, an easy way to uh, uh, to generate those efficiently, at least back in, in those days. So, um, however, most of the clean and effective privacy payments systems or payment systems that have a privacy aspect use the original blind signature concept to to attain it. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it, it basically, it gave the essential tool through which the nicest privacy and payment systems uh, to this day uh, are, can be built. So I'm sorry, was that the question? How, uh, what survives it from it? Yeah, that that's what survives. It, it, I mean, it survives. The basic idea of blind signature and so on is just prevalent in all kinds of privacy technology solutions. It's not the only way to do it in all cases, uh, but it is um, still dominant. I didn't really receive pushback on the desirability of the privacy, but I did. Get a lot of feedback about how difficult it might be to actually, you know, implement and affect these these kind of changes, and um, that certainly it, 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 it turned out to be true. It wasn't easy because you know you're trying to sell like a, a really kind of like a nice to have aspirational kind of um, you know sort of liberal value uh, into a marketplace where people are trying to make a living and trying to make money and, you know, 
it's it, it's just an extra uh, distraction cost and um, it, it, it its value wasn't widely appreciated by the general public, in part because it was never really offered to them. So they were sort of unaware of it, of it as an alternative. That makes sense. In other words, if you don't know that you could get a, uh, a car that has uh, whatever brightly colored paint, uh, you'd be happy buying a, a black Model T. Something to that effect, right? I mean, the, the, obviously, most of the public mostly only is aware of those things which are are offered to them. They're not thinking about uh, aspects and features that, that aren't made available to them because they're not actionable alternatives. As I, I try to argue, uh, I, I thought it was pretty clear it's a, that I have laid out even in the Scientific American article, which appeared in, in like in 92, that uh, a more or less a comprehensive solution to personal privacy in the information age for consumers, and that involves the use of digital pseudonyms and untraceable cash and untraceable electronic mail, or communication more generally, and um, so how to do it technically has been known for quite some time, but the thing that's I believe has impeded its widespread adoption is that it's hard to use it at the uh, level of sophistication that's really necessary to gain significant advantage and that's where AI could help, right? By making it easy to use, so that AI can manage all these different pseudonyms and who knows what about you and what would be enough to convince so and so about this and that and and all that sort of thing, with without bothering you with the details of that. I, I have addressed this publicly before. I would just say that uh, you know it's pretty widely known that children of quite a range of ages are. Um, very sensitive to, uh, 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 very aware of, and appreciate the power of secrecy. And hide and go seek, peekaboo, is a cultural universal. It's apparently, all cultures, infants, find this the, like the first most amusing thing, um, and you know, this kind of. Uh, Appreciation of the power of secrecy, uh, you know, develops a, 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 as they grow, uh, a, you know, because as you know, the, it gives them an asymmetric advantage over adults. I mean, you know, a little kid, even though adults are much more, you know, powerful, clever, or whatever, bigger, uh, you know, whatever it is, they, you know, if the kid knows it and the adult doesn't, I mean, that's the kid's still winning. So I was appreciating the power of secrecy and growing up in an era when, you know, anyone that had a kind of liberal set of values wasn't really were really unhappy with the way the government was uh, pursuing the war in Vietnam in that in those days and you know, there was a, there was growing economic prosperity and so what that that sort of inherently leads to a kind of freewheeling youth culture because kids aren't really afraid that if they step out of line, that they're going to have, they're really going to be consequences to pay later, and they, you know, they the youth culture could dominate, and that's what happened. And uh, you know, you can add in several other ingredients. That, and uh, anyway, so um, uh, it, it, it was it was pretty clear that the kind of conventional approach to privacy was very constrained and kind of uh, limited in its, uh, the kind of technology 
uh, you know, uh, evolution stage that it that would be applicable to. So, you know, in those days we had these things like uh, the OECD principles and there was the uh, you know, Privacy Protection Study Commission report was by Rand, a big, big fat phone book and all this stuff where it basically said, well, you have to have the right to know the, what records will be maintained about you and to revise them, review them. If there are errors, you should have the right to correct them. Those were the big principles. So the presumption was that everything was being kept and, and you know, you just maybe had the right to, I don't know, correct it, which is hardly threatening to an institution, I guess, because um, it just gives it better data, right? So it's like, you know, that, uh, uh, so the whole privacy uh, issue was kind of channeled into this um, pretty useless um, uh, you know, constrained environment where uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of obvious to me that, that you know, there were much broader issues and with much bigger implications. And so that fit very well with a sort of countercultural, uh, you know, th the kind of cultural right orientation, right? So you say, well, the government's all wrong. They're trying to tell us the privacy is about this, but really it's about these more fundamental things. So I guess that's that's a part of it. And the other part of it is that I was, you know, interested in and studied uh, cryptographic techniques, and I was aware of their utility in, the, you know, in this context. And that gave me a bit of a, you know, unique advantage. Most people, you know, didn't think of things that way. Um, no, it's kind of the opposite uh, in the sense that, uh, like, I dedicated my dissertation to my PhD advisor, I guess the chairman of the department, this big deal guy, uh, you know, Manuel Blum. He was, you know, obviously he was a genius when he was younger, and, uh, you know, but he, um, you know, he told me in no uncertain terms that uh, you know, it's not only a waste of time, but almost wrong for me to work on technology with, a, you know, a kind of social uh, objective in mind because it was impossible to be certain what the impact of your technology would be. And this is a bit of, you know, conventional wisdom, but it, it, it's not really applicable to privacy technology because privacy technology is arguably mainly really only helps protect the individual. So I took issue with that. So it, the dissertation, you know, it was the rejection of this principle that inspired this work. You know, so it, it, I also read stuff from like scientists that ran corporation, other people, you know, were talking about all this, you know, the military approach to security and stuff. And it was also, you know, a bit of a rejection of of the kind of mechanisms they were proposing. I think it was they were saying, I mean, you know, this is sort of generally uh, regarded as a good operating principle, uh, you know, we say in English, follow the money, right? Now, that doesn't mean be a sellout, it, but I think to me, in this context, it, its significance is that if you want to try to affect significant change, you had better not sort of dismiss, ignore, underestimate the importance money could play in the, you know, which which solution prevails. Yeah. You know, like I say, mind the gap, mind the money. David, do you have any last words to your audience? <laughs> oh, th thanks, it's a pleasure. I've never been interviewed by an AI. <laughs> before it's, a, it's interesting I think that AI wasn't aware of everything I've said publicly which is it's comforting but I guess it's only a matter of time right <laughs>